The streets of Pontiac, Michigan may not look like a lot these days, but they still play host to one of the most historic venues in wrestling history, the magnificent Pontiac Silverdome. It was here on March 29, 1987, that an event produced a noise heard around the world. That event was WrestleMania 3, a world record 93,000 fans. The noise was a near 600 pound Andre the Giant being body slammed to the canvas. The man who slammed him that night is my special guest on this episode of The Voice Versus. Hello everybody, I'm Michael Chevello. Welcome to The Voice Versus, the immortal Hulk Hogan. Strap yourselves in and ask yourself this question. What you gonna do when The Voice and The Hulkster run wild on you? The immortal Hulk Hogan. Welcome to the Welcome Voice Versus, brother. Thank you very much. Thank it's an you, absolute man. pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Just to start off, just want to say with the facial hair, no, the curtains on the face do not match the carpet. I have dyed this blonde as a tribute to your lustrous facial hair and also a man who inspired your career, superstar Billy Graham. So, and I tell you what, peroxiding a uh, usually dark brown goatee takes a long time and burnt my chin off in the hotel room. Well, brother, there's, a, there's an art to that. First off, Legally, you've crossed a boundary. This is called gimmick infringement. <laughs> because the blonde mustache and the black beard, that's Hollywood Hogan. And uh, there's an art to that. You put a fan next to your face. The fan? Because your eyes start burning when you put the peroxide. I, I almost passed out twice yeah, from smelling so, the peroxide. So the best thing is just put a fan next to your face and it blows everything by and you're cool. But uh, thank you. And you got the Hulk Hogan haircut too. So <laughs> We're the same barber. You're on, you're on, brother. You're definitely on. <laughs> I want to say that one of the most amazing sights I've ever seen in pro wrestling was when you slammed Andre the Giant at uh, WrestleMania 3 in 1987, where he was pushing you know, near 600 pounds. Uh, I've got to know, what physical toll did that take on you, slamming a near 600 pound Andre the Giant? You know, the, the crowd was there. They were expecting 94,000 people or 93,000, whatever. They were expecting something huge. Andre had came off a huge back surgery and he was in a lot of pain and uh, we went to the airport and he got on the scales and you said over 600 pounds he was actually closer to seven wow he was around 685 690 on the cargo scales at northwest and he had the back surgery gained a lot of weight and he came for that one match for the business to help me and to help the business and it was different because he was in a in a in a in an indifferent mood. He was in a lot of pain, and I sat next to him in the dressing room, and we spent a lot of time talking. And you know, it got to the point where I was asking him, you know, what do you want to do out of there? And, and every answer was, "Don't worry, boss. You know, don't worry." So, I had no idea what was really going to happen. And when I tried to pick him up in the beginning, he sat down on me. You know, and I fell backwards with him. And so I kind of like forgot about it. And then halfway through the match, under his voice, he goes, slam. I'm like, what? <laughs> and he, he yelled at me again, you know, slam. And, I, and, I, and he came towards me. I got underneath him. I didn't get him way up here. And, but when I got him to here, I didn't think I'd turn him. I just said, the hell with it. And when I turned him, it you know, tore my back. And it tore my bicep. It tore my delt in three places. But oh. I turned him over. And uh, he didn't have to do that. I mean, he did that for the wrestling business to basically give me enough gas in my tank to help me carry on. So he did something that was very unselfish and, and you know, he taught me a lot about, you know, passing the torch. Wrestling has taken a tremendous impact on your body, and I know that you've always been listed at six foot seven. Yeah. Standing next to you now, you seem to be more around six four, six five. Is it actually true that you've shrunk due to a lot of the surgeries uh, on your on your back and on your knees? And I even hear that your tailbone is is curved from all the yeah. impact your spine's taken over the years. All of that is true. Wow. Um, and, um, and the house I grew up in was a very small two bedroom wooden frame house. And the one thing that my mother used to love to do was measure people. If she, you came to the, the house. The on the wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come, here, come here, we want to measure you. Everybody came to the house. It didn't matter who she wanted to measure them. So right when I first started wrestling and when I started working out with Hiro Matsuda, she measured me on the wall barefooted and I was six foot seven. And then uh, a few years before my dad passed away and then just recently my mom passed away, Right before my dad passed away, I was having all kinds of problems with my back and I was 
walking sideways and my mom was come over here we want to measure you and I was six foot four mm -hmm. and it was 30 years of jumping up and landing on my butt with that leg drop and you know I had had uh, a, a ton of problems you know and so now after the knee replacement the hip replacement and now after I, I just had my eighth back surgery where they straightened me up I'm a little wow. over six foot five now wow. so I've got back about an inch and a half but I was six seven and because of the 30 years of wrestling, of jumping up and landing on my butt every single night yeah. when we were wrestling 300 days a year, I pretty much crushed and bent my spine. And, uh, you know, you, you learn so many things. We had a talk off camera earlier that you learn, uh, you understand how much you don't yeah. know about this business the longer you're in it. And if I would have known what I know now, I would use the sleeper. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I would have never taken a bump for a finish. <laughs> Yeah. You know, uh, you spoke about Matsuda, and you spent a great deal of time in Japan early in your career, wrestling over there. Uh, you inspired a lot of cartoon characters, especially an action figure from the Kanuku Man character named Mr. Neptune. Can you tell me a bit about your time wrestling in Japan? Well, you know, it was kind of like destiny that I end up there, because when I started in this business, Hiro Matsuda decided to help me. I had become very obnoxious as a wrestling fan and hanging out and showing up at the wrestling matches and the TV matches or wherever the wrestlers would eat or whatever bar they'd go, I would show up and I kind of drove the wrestlers crazy, had the shirt sleeves rolled up because I was working out. Um, it was quite obvious that I needed to be taught a lesson. And so, you know, the first day I went to work out with Matsuda, he broke my leg. And uh, What did he break it with? What move? Do you remember? He sat actually sat between my legs with his back to me. He grabbed the front of my toe, he put his elbow in my shin, and as he pulled my toe back, oh. he, he snapped my, uh, the bone in half here, whatever this bone is. Oh, wow. So he basically just sat between my legs. If I'd have known what I was doing, I could have hooked him from behind, but yeah. I didn't have a clue. He just sat between my legs and he took what he wanted and put his elbow in my shin and posted my toe and it just snapped. But you and, came uh, back again, right? Yeah, I was gone for about three and a half, four months, and I came back. He couldn't get rid of me. And so after a couple of years of working out with him, we became good friends. And then he started teaching me the submissions and the little hooks and just little things back then that you needed. But nowadays, you know, yeah. those, are, those things are pretty much extinct in the wrestling business. 1991, Detroit, Undertaker, championship match. He puts a tombstone pile driver on you, goes a little wrong, and almost puts you out of wrestling forever, is that correct? Yeah, I can't remember exactly how it ended up. I, I don't remember if we were on the floor or the ring or a chair on the concrete floor or the ring. I don't really remember. But I looked the tape back and my head never hit. <laughs> you know, I just remember it was just the jerk of my neck and uh, my traps went up like this for like a month and they wouldn't Oof. come down. And they had me in the hospital and several doctors flew in and everybody wanted to cut on me and my wife Linda pulled me out of there and I uh, came back to Florida and I had a chiropractor and some neuromassage guy working on me and I still don't have any feeling in my uh, shoulders and my triceps or my hands are numb wow I can't feel anything with my hands but you know I got everything else back you know but uh, it was it was uh, it wasn't anybody's fault it was just for some reason, whatever was wrong with my neck from all those years, yeah. that, just that little jerk, because my head didn't hit. It wasn't like it wasn't like he dropped me or okay. I slipped. It wasn't anything like that. It was just the the jerk just of my neck yeah. neck not being strong enough. 1996, Bash at the Beach, WCW. Uh, history was made a real turning point in pro wrestling. After being a babyface for so long, which is, a, for those that don't know much about wrestling, is a good guy. Yeah. You, I mean, you'd started your career as a bad guy, as a heel. You were babyface through, you know, most of the WrestleManias, etc. But then Bash at the Beach, you started the NWO. That, yeah. You know, I don't need to explain it for wrestling fans. Yeah. What was it like going back to being a heel after so many years as being a good guy? Well, you know, we, we kind of like had talked, Eric Bischoff and, and Ted... Ted Turner, we, we talked several times because the numbers kind of flattened out and Eric Bischoff and I were talking with Ted Turner and we said, what could we do that, you know, hasn't been done ever? I said, well, that's been done, but, you know, we could turn me into a bad guy, you know, and it had been done earlier on, like you said, yeah. but nobody remembered it and nobody, there wasn't that mass audience. So, you know, when I, when I turned into a bad guy, you know, it, it, the moment was magic. You know, there was just a little bit taken away on TV because, you know, Bobby Heenan, God bless his soul, he's mm. a good friend of mine. I'd been a good guy for so long, but when I was walking down, it was a six-man tag. Mm. 
and I think Macho and Sting were in there, I don't remember, against Nash and Hall and mm -hmm. somebody. And I just remember as I came walking down to the ring, everybody thought I was a good guy. Yep. And Bobby Heenan goes, but which side is he on? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> it kind of took away a little bit of the magic, hmm. you know, but that was Oh, a, trust me, brother. It was still magic. It was yeah, unthinkable. Yeah, but it was just uh, It was just one of those on the spot Bobby was it, was it fun to play the heel again. Yeah, 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 you looked like you had a lot of fun. Well, I'm doing it now I yeah. mean, I'm, I'm doing it now. I just keep I just don't grow the black beard in because it's all gray And it's such a pain <laughs> in the pain in the butt to put the, the black dye yeah. in it just makes a mess in the bathroom and my wife's towels <laughs> turn all black. So I'm thinking about growing it out this week now that I've seen you. Looks good still. Yeah, Should it's cool. It. It's cool looking. Should do it. Batman may be a Hollywood screen hero, but Hulk Hogan is a very real hero to many people. When we return to The Voice versus the immortal Hulk Hogan, we'll find out how the Hulk got his nickname and also how he almost missed the opportunity to star opposite Sylvester Stallone in Rocky III. famous name in wrestling history but before Hulkamania Terry Bollea was known for a few other in-ring names including Super Destroyer and Terry Boulder. So how did he become the Hulk? Let's find out. I believe the name Hulk was originally given to you after you appeared on a TV show where Lou Ferrigno the Incredible Hulk was on the same show and you actually dwarfed Lou Ferrigno at the time so it was decided to name you Hulk is that true? Well yeah I was I was in uh... Dothan, Alabama, and we were going to Mobile, Alabama, the little circuit. And they asked me to come on a local show, and The Incredible Hulk, his new TV series was out. And I just happened to be on the same set as him with the same person. And they went, oh my gosh, you're bigger than the Hulk. And at the time, Lou was in really good shape. Yeah. And he, he can go way over 300 pounds. And at the time, Lou was doing the TV show, and he's probably about 265 all ripped up, and I was 330 pounds. Big arms and a huge big belly, because that's how wrestlers were supposed to look back in the day. Big arms and a big stomach. You know, there were no bodybuilders in yeah. wrestling. And so the, the person, the announcer goes, oh my gosh, you're bigger than the Hulk. And so when I went back, I was wrestling under the name Terry Boulder at the time. And everybody started calling me Terry the Hulk Boulder. And that's kind of how the Hulk name gets started. Okay. You know, you shot to major fame with the cameo appearance in Rocky III as Thunderlips, but I believe it almost didn't happen because when Stallone approached you the first time, you didn't believe it was for real that Stallone was contacting you? I just seen the first two movies. Yeah. Oh my God, Stallone was 150 feet tall in the public's eyes. And, and this really big wrestler, Gorilla Monsoon, handed me a Western Union letter and said, call Mr. Stallone about, you know, an appearance in a Rocky movie. And I, all of a sudden, for me to get this Western Union letter, ah, it's a rib, because, you know, <laughs> wrestlers are really funny. Hey, your car's on fire out there or something, and nothing's wrong, you know. So I threw the letter away, <clears throat> and I went to Japan for four weeks. And I called Vince Sr. back, and I said, hey, can I stay another four weeks? And so when I came back, you know, like eight or nine or ten weeks later, I came right back to the Allentown TV tapings again. And this time, Monsoon says, look, this guy's driving us crazy. You need to call him back. And it was another uh, letter from Stallone's office. So when I called him back, they said, we wanted you to do this part called Thunder Lips, the Ultimate Mail, and when can you come to uh, LA? So I went out there and I got the part and did it for no money at all. Is it true that Stallone, during the rehearsal, when he was sort of auditioning you, got you fired up and said, you know, hit him and throw him for real? Yeah, he told me to hit him as hard as I could, and I said, no, that's, I don't... Sloan's only a tiny guy, though, right? Yeah, he's 5'6", five, 5'7", five, but in really good shape, yeah. you know. And I told him, I, I don't think you want that. And he went, no, no, hit me, and you had the cameras on. He was filming everything, like for a documentary or whatever he did with the footage back in the day. And he was, no, hit me, hit me. So I said, well, you know, just bend over, I'll give you about 50%. You know, I was pretty heavy-handed yeah. at the time. And, uh, you know, when I hit him between the shoulders, as soon as I made contact, his face hit my cowboy boots. He came up bleeding. Oh, my God, that's great. You know, and <laughs> a, little, a little psycho, but he's, he's in it, man. He did all of his own stunts. I mean, everything we did in the ring, he 
the, the really stiff power slam from corner to corner where I just landed on top of him on purpose. He took it and yeah. I could see the blood come up in his mouth and go back in and he did everything. I mean, he was amazing. Looked great on cinema. Looked yeah, fantastic. he was, he was yeah. really, really in for, the, in for the punishment. He was something. At what point do you feel that Hulkamania truly began? Was it WrestleMania 1 or was it before that when you first beat the Sheik for the title? When do you feel Hulkamania was truly born? Well, you know, even before I, I came to uh, New York to wrestle the Iron Sheik in January of 84, I had started the Hulkamania type theme. You know, I saw, I saw the Beatlemania thing going yep. on. I said, hmm, it's not a pretty cool name. I'd started the Hulkamania thing in the AWA. Vern Gagne was a promoter. And that thing was catching on. You know, I started talking about Hulkamania in the interview. So on, on a small, you know, territorial scale, that Hulkamania thing was on fire. And I just knew if I could get on a larger stage that this had the vibe, it had the feel, that it, was, it had legs, that there could be some traction. You know, and that's when Vince Jr. gave me a call. And he says, hey, I'd like to talk. You know, we were just getting ready to, to make our move. And I went back to work for Vince Jr. Hmm. You know, talking about uh, this man, the Iron Sheik, a photo of him here, <laughs> <laughs> Sheik in his older days, around about that, just a recent photo. Is it true or urban legend that he was offered $100,000 to break your leg in that championship match at Madison Square Garden? He's the one that said he was. I mean, he, he said Vern Gagne because when I was in the AWA in Minnesota, there'd been a tug of war with Vern and I. Mm -hmm. And when Vince McMahon came, Vince Jr. flew into Minnesota, uh, we talked and we made a deal about four or five in the morning. We shook hands and I was going to go back to New York and tear the place down, you know. And when I left, Vern Gagne was very upset. No one's ever done this in the wrestling business. No one's ever just walked out, which isn't true. Yeah. But Vern Gagne was, oh my gosh, he, no one's ever done this. And so the Sheik tells us after the match, after it's all over, you know, when, when everything is done, you know, that Vern Gagne had offered him $100,000 to break my leg. But that's the story from the Sheik. So whether it's true or not, I, I don't know. It's the Sheik story, so. <laughs> you know, the Sheik's become a bit of a freak lately. You may have seen him on the Howard Stern show. He goes on these ra racist ty you know, tirades. He's, he's not all there, the Sheik. And there's some crazy stories about him back in the day. I remember reading one about uh, how he used to do handstands while snorting lines of cocaine. Uh, how crazy was the Sheik? back in those days, is, is it comparable to how crazy he comes across now in these interviews that he does? Well, you know, we were trying to work with the guys and keep them on track. And I remember back in the day when the WWF was drug testing, I remember, you know, we told the Sheik that, you know, you came up positive on the drug test. He goes, oh, thank you, thank you very much. He said, no, <laughs> that's not good. You know, that's not a good thing, you know? And uh, my daughter, who sings, she was singing the national anthem at a, a New York Jets game. Yep. And, and the governor was there at the New York Jets game, and there were these highway patrol officers were there, and the highway patrol officer goes, look at this picture. And it was a picture of him and another officer with a sheik standing there. And they're holding up a couple of these big bags of cocaine that they found oh, in the sheik's right. wrestling, but the sheik's there standing with his thumb <laughs> up, you know? And this highway patrol guy's got him at the back of the car right before they busted him. And it was two of the highway patrol guys in the Sheik and he's smiling from ear to ear and they're holding up the contraband that they found. So he's a freak. Yeah, he's a bit out there now. Clearwater, Florida, a great place to people watch. You know what is also great to watch? WrestleMania! When we return to The Voice versus the immortal Hulk Hogan, Hulk takes a walk down memory lane, revisits WrestleMania 1 and some of those epic WrestleMania rivalries, including The Ultimate Warrior and Randy Macho Man Savage. In 1985, New York was the home to a major turning point in wrestling history. Madison Square Garden, the home to WrestleMania 1. Ooh, Hulk Hogan and Mr. T versus Rowdy Roddy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. What you gonna do, brother, when Hulk Hogan takes a walk down memory lane? Let's talk WrestleMania, the event that truly made you the superstar of superstars in wrestling, a pop culture icon. 
I remember watching WrestleMania 1, 1985. I was 10 years old, watching with my mum in front of the television, beamed in live to Australia at about, geez, 10 o'clock at night. One of the rare nights I was allowed to stay up beyond 7.30. You, Mr. T, Paul Orndorff, Rowdy Roddy Piper, Cowboy Ace, uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Timekeeper outside was uh, Liberace <laughs> ringing the bell and Muhammad Ali, special outside referee. What are your recollections of, of that event, WrestleMania 1? There was a lot of jealousy because nobody understood what Vince was doing. You know, Vince was way outside the box from what his father did. His father had a, a vision, uh, the standard vision of being the best wrestling company and staying very territorial. Vince had a character called Hulk Hogan that he knew would appeal to middle America and, and to the whole world. It was just the timing was impeccable. You had this all-American hero that says he's from California with the blonde hair and the golden tan and his morals are training prayers and vitamins. It was the ultimate perfect character that would transcend any language, any barrier, and, and, and the physicalities of the way this character looked and the actions in the ring, that transcended and translated in any language. So he put everything on the line for WrestleMania. And I just remember there were so many wrestlers that were jealous. There was a, a wrestler named David Schultz, Dr. D, who thought WrestleMania was his idea to bring Mr. T in. And it wasn't, it was Vince's idea. Um, I had become friends with Mr. T because I was doing the A-team. And of course, I told Vince, hey, it would be great if we got this guy in the ring. And at, at the time, nobody had, had done that with celebrities, but I knew the guy had an amateur wrestling background from, from high school, and since he was an actor, I figured if we could keep him calmed down, we could pretty much pull it off. Uh, Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff was a, a redneck kid from Brandon, Florida, and he had a reputation. He just lived a few miles away from here. He was a real redneck type kid, and, and just even when he got in the wrestling business, he had that same mentality. You know, Mr. T's not a wrestler, he's an actor, we're gonna break his leg. And at the time, Roddy Piper mm. had that same mentality. Nobody had switched gears yet. We're gonna have to protect this business. And, you know, even if we shoot our own selves in the foot, we're gonna hurt this guy. So basically, I had to have long conversations, you know, with Piper and Orndorff, look, don't hurt this guy. There's a huge opportunity Vince wants to do something that's never been done before and, and make everybody household worldwide stars. And this is the, the diving board for us to take off on. So, you know, it took a while to calm the wrestlers down. And Mr. T was really, really good at working out and getting in the ring. And, and there's a lot of conditioning that goes on, especially with your nerves. Yeah. When you get in the ring, you can be very calm talking with me here now, but if I step in a ring with you in front of 40,000 people in a wrestling world, I don't know what happens, but your demeanor changes inside. Your, your energy and your nerves, will, believe me, will change if I've got my red and yellow stuff and I'm staring you down. I don't care if you're an MMA fighter or what, it just the whole thing changes for some reason. So I was worried about that with Mr. T, but once we got through the match, you know, and, and, and if, you, if you do watch the end of the match, you'll see how out of gas Mr. T was. He couldn't even hardly stand yeah. up. But once we got through the match, we knew we hit a home run. We knew that we were off and running and that WrestleMania was the pivotal point to take the Hulk Hogan character and showcase wrestling to make it a household name in every foreign country and to take this little teeny territorial company, the WWF, along for the ride with it. Whether the WWF was the, the machine behind the man or the machine and the man were one, it was a long, beautiful ride. And it's amazing that yeah. Vince and I could be, like Vince and I, when we were together, we were such a great team. I mean, two sticks are harder to break than one. When we were together, we were just, whatever his strong points were, we'd run with it. Whatever my strong points were, we'd run with it. Whatever his shortcomings were, we covered it. Whatever my shortcomings were, we were a great team, and we always were. And, uh, and it just shows how strong both entities are, that we're still both alive now and running. WrestleMania three. we spoke earlier on about you uh, slamming Andre. What sort of person was Andre though? Because I've heard various stories about Andre. There's, there's the um, stories that he was arrogant, stories that he was a racist at times. He had a run in I heard with Bad News Brown once on a, on a bus that Bad News called him out and Andre had made a racist comment towards Bad News Brown and then he backed off when Bad News put it on him. Um, you said that Andre taught you to have character in wrestling business and how to be a professional in the business. What was your relationship like with Andre and what sort of person was he that you knew him? 
Let me address the Bad News Brown story Please. first because I was sitting behind Bad News and Andre was behind me, so I was in the middle of him. Just to say what I've heard, just before you explain the story, is that Andre had called Bad News the N-word and as a result I heard that Bad News had called the bus driver to stop the bus, had gotten up and basically said to Andre, get your ass outside and let's settle this, and then Andre had backed down. So I'd like to hear your version of what actually happened. It's really amazing to hear that. Um, not true at all. Okay. Andre was telling the joke with the N-word, and Bad News Brown was sitting in front of me, and Bad News Brown mumbled something under his voice. It's not too damn funny, Andre. And Bad News Brown started to go into his bag with his hand, and he had a little satchel, like a purse that he wore over his shoulder. I guess you'd call it a man purse. Yeah. Back in the day, I'd never seen one before. And he had this satchel over his shoulder, and he went to go in the, in the, in the, the bag, probably to get something, not a weapon. Yeah. And Andre, said, you know, if you're pulling something out like a weapon, I'm going to stick it up your ass. <laughs> but the bus was never stopped. He never called him out. But I've heard so many yeah. versions of the story. But I was sitting there between them. I was on the bus. I was in the seat between them. And, and that's all there is to the story. Another funny story I heard about Andre, I don't know if you can confirm or deny this one. Is it true that when Andre used to go to Japan, he couldn't fit in the toilets? They are pretty small. I have trouble over in Japan. So to take a dump, he'd actually lay paper out on the bed and take a dump in the middle of his or, bed. Or he'd use the bathtub. Oh, really? Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> every once in a while, he would have a very special moment going to the bathroom. And we stayed at the Keio Plaza Hotel. And on several occasions, I'd get the, hur, hur, hur. hey, boss, <laughs> come down here. I said, oh, come on, Andre. No, come on, you got to see this. I'd walk in and either be, you know, a newspaper on the bed <laughs> or in the bathtub. And he used to think that was the, he'd get the biggest kick out of that. But it, it wouldn't happen too often. That's a shame. I've stayed in Coyo Plaza Hotel like four times. It's a beautiful hotel. I can't picture it being soiled by those elephant dumps that Andre must have done back in the day. You know, moving ahead to WrestleMania 5, the clash of the mega powers, you versus uh, Macho Man Savage. Yeah, you know, brother, i got to rewind something on you here. Yeah, you, please. You know, i got to explain to you about Andre, you know. Please, yes. When you asked me what kind of person he was, you know, racist or whatever you said about him. Yes, yes. Arrogance or racism, what I'd heard. Yeah, Some varying stories. What you need to understand is, you know, the first eight years, I was, I took the brunt of the punishment from him because when I first started working with him, he would show up and he would travel and all these, show up in all these different territories. And, and at the time, I was this young kid and I thought I could be as big as Andre and it'd be as strong. And so I was, I'd go at him wide open in the ring. And, you know, he had fun beating on me, you know, and he, and he was, it was a situation where, you know, the first few years he, you know, I was just another kid that didn't understand this business. And when I finally smartened up and started having respect for this business, from that point on, I started to understand what Andre was all about. He loved this business and he protected it, you know. So at the end of the day, you hear all these people say, well, he's arrogant or he did this to me or he did that. And like one of my friends, the nasty boy who wasn't a wrestler at the time, him and Jerry Sags, his partner, came walking in the dressing room looking for somebody. Andre goes, get out! And he yelled at him and chased him. That's the only story they tell about Andre, how mean he was. Mm. But a lot of people don't understand. There was never a chair, there was never a knife, a fork, a bed. There was never a situation where he could ever be comfortable. He was a seven foot two, almost seven three, almost a seven foot four giant that because of getting crippled and all the injuries, he shrank down almost to seven feet and a little below that. But the whole time I watched him, if he walked ahead of me in the airport, I heard people say horrible things mm -hmm. and make fun of him. He lived in a really cruel world. And at the end of the day, when you really understood what he went through and what he was all about, he was a very gracious person, you know, with a kind heart. But he didn't put up with any BS. Yeah. You know, he didn't put up with any games, any, just any, any kind of chicanery. He was pretty stiff, but a lot of people don't understand the big picture. So I just want to set the record straight that with Andre, once you got to know him and you understood the man, you understood what his life was like and, and why he was like he was. Thank you. Thank you for setting that straight. And we've had to WrestleMania five, Clash of the Mega Powers, which I thought was one of the most brilliant storylines ever conjured. I mean, you versus Macho Man Randy Savage, best of friends become bitter enemies. What was uh, Macho Man like uh, professionally as an opponent, first of all? Well, I get asked that question all the time. Mm. You know, number one, I made more money with Randy than anybody else. On a professional level, he worked the gimmick perfectly. 
he never let his ego get involved with this, like so many people let their ego get involved. They don't want to do a job or they don't want to lose. Or, you know, he just was strictly business and he had the gimmick down. I mean, he was a pleasure to work with. You could count on him being there. He never pulled up short. Even when he got hurt really bad, he'd still wrestle. And he was the most consistent person as far as being a businessman I'd ever been in the ring with. And, and that, that counts for everything. You know, being consistent and working. And when, when a promoter puts a huge load on you, you know that you've, if you've got to wrestle seven or 800 times in a row over a course of several years, you make all the appearances and you don't break a fingernail or you break a, a bone in your hand or you get your teeth knocked out or you lose the vision in your left eye and you, and you can't, oh, I can't work because I can't see out of my eye anymore. Nothing stopped him. Outside the ring, though, we hear different stories about your relationship <laughs> with Savage. Uh, care to go there? I mean, there's yeah, oh, you know, yeah, a lot of rumors sure. that have flown no, over the years. No, I, stories of Savage blaming you for his divorce to Miss Elizabeth. Yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. can you clarify any of that, your relationship yeah, he, with him? He blamed me for everything. Yeah. He, uh, if it was a cloudy day, it was my fault. Um, yeah, Randy was real paranoid. I mean, when he'd walk through the dressing room, he would make Elizabeth look down. Oh, don't look at anybody. Don't look at her. I'll kill you. You know, he, he always was in character, and he just was so paranoid of his wife. And I remember when he first moved down the beach from us, they bought a little house on Kensington. And, you know, it's a beautiful little house with a big front door. And all of a sudden, he built a cage around the front door with another locked door. Wow. I'm leaving for six days. You've got six TV dinners. Don't leave the house. Ooh, yeah. Wow. You know, and he was just really tripped, you know, and just kept her on a real short leash and just was super paranoid of, of anybody that was around. And it's uh, to this day, you know, he, he, he's remarried. Yeah. He, he married his high school sweetheart. Yeah. He lives down in Seminole, which is very close to here. And just like the WWE did a, a Legends thing, yeah. and they needed him to do some promos, he made them come to his house. He won't even leave his house anymore. Wow. WrestleMania 6, Hulk Hogan versus The Ultimate Warrior. Huh. Is it true that five minutes into the match against Warrior, he was freaking out, he wanted to go home? Yeah, he was pretty much blown up. Really? And there's, if you, if you kind of like uh, look back at the tape, there's a spot where I got him in a rear chin lock. And he's telling me, let's go home, let's go home, which means he just wanted to do the end of the match where he beat me. Wow. I said, no, brother, you know, we're here in front of 77,000 people, you know, and you're supposed to grill a press. I can't remember the finish, but somewhere he grill a press me over his head and yeah. splash me, and I was going to kick out of his finish. And then I was going to hit him with a boot and then drop the leg. He was going to kick out of the finish. I can't remember what it was, but we had a great storyline told, you know, and... I just grabbed him in a rear chin lock and he was panicking. He's shaking his arms, trying to do the warrior thing. Let's go, let's get out of here. I said, bro, it's five minutes, man. He ain't going nowhere. You just calm down, catch your breath, and let me know when you're ready because these people still be rumbling. So just get your shit straight and calm down because he was, he wanted to get out of the ring right away. I mean, that was meant to be a passing of the torch. You know, Hulk Hogan passing the torch to Ultimate Warrior, but it, he never had that torch and, and ran with it. Why do you think that Ultimate Warrior gimmick just didn't go over as greatly as maybe what was expected. I mean, it could not compare at all to Hulk Hogan. Well, there's, there's a bigger storyline than that that a lot of people don't realize, and most wrestling fans or boys in the business or marks, people that ask me questions about this business don't understand, but that was supposed to be the beginning of the demise of Hulkamania. Mm -hmm. Because the Hulkamania character had gotten so huge it was out of control, and Vince was trying to switch gears because this Hulkamania was all-knowing and all-powerful. That was their opening to put a bullet in Hulkamania, but it didn't work. They don't, no one realizes how loyal these fans are. I mean, people grew up with me. People that are 70 and 80 years old used to be 40 and 50 years old. They're still Hulkamaniacs. Kids that are three and four years old are my fans now. I mean, there were so many great gimmicks around in those days. Guys like yeah, Macho Man, Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Mr. Perfect, Rick Rude, Jake the Snake Roberts, but none of them attained what you attained. And again, you know, I'm just trying to fathom the reason why someone like a Jake the Snake or, or Mr. Perfect, their gimmicks could not hit the height of Hulk Hogan. It's, it's more than the gimmick. It's, you, we gave the ball to a lot of people. Hmm. You know, we gave the ball to the ultimate warrior. You know, we put the belt on Randy. We gave Randy the ball. 
Everybody runs differently with the football. It, and I'm not just talking about in the ring. It's outside the ring too, and what's in your heart, and the Make-A-Wish kids, and the way you, you know, treated people on the street, and, and just that this Hulkamania thing is always going to be around. It's it's immortal. You know, I, long after I'm dead and gone, it's going to be it'll live forever because it was such a it's intertwined in our society, yeah. not just America, but in Australia, and, yeah. and it's not going away. You know, so but that's one of the things that a lot of the promoters and people didn't understand. You know, the Vince McMahons and the Vince Russos, they just didn't understand how powerful this gimmick is. WrestleMania 18, Hollywood Hulk Hogan versus The Rock. I thought this was one of your greatest WrestleMania performances ever. You came in as the bad guy, but you won over the crowd. Uh, what do you remember about that experience versus The Rock? Well, I knew that was gonna happen because I've been around this gimmick for a long time. I know it as well as anybody. And so, you know, when they brought me in as the bad guy, which was fine with me, mm -hmm. You know, they had me do the worst things you could do. I hit the rock with a hammer. Yeah. I put him in an ambulance. I chained the doors. I ran him over and I tried to murder him. And I ran him over with an 18 wheeler semi. I mean, that's as <laughs> low as you can get. But once again, when people are trying to put a bullet in this gimmick yeah. and they're trying to kill Hulkamania, the fans fight back. Yeah. And it was just another huge lesson for the promoters that when you put me in the ring with the ultimate good guy, the guy that's got his brand new movie, The Scorpion King, coming yeah. out, can you smell what the rock's cooking every single week? The audience has been inundated with this guy, and, and he's getting the push of all pushes. You put him in the ring with the gimmick man, Hulk Hogan, and the fans will let you know who they believe and who the oil is. You know, professional wrestling is scripted, but the bumps are real, and so too are the cuts. When we return to The Voice versus the immortal Hulk Hogan, Hulk tells us about his days as one of the best blade men in the business and how he cut himself time and time again in the ring with a hidden razor blade. to Clearwater, Florida, and The Voice versus the immortal Hulk Hogan. You know, Hulk Hogan has had some of the bloodiest matches in wrestling history. He's known throughout the business as one of the finest blade men. That means an ability to cut himself over and over again without you, the viewer at home, ever seeing how he does it. So how does he do it? Well, let's ask the Hulkster to give away a few of the tricks of the trade. Throughout your history, you've been known as a great blade man. Uh, you do great blade jobs. You've had some blood baths where you've cut yourself, and it, it, you know, you've, you've done it perfectly. How did you manage to become such a good blade man? What's the secret behind being a good blade man? Uh, I, there's no secret to it. You just have to be, uh, a lot of it has to do with where you carry the blade, you know? Where did you carry your blade? I, ca I carry the blade in my mouth, you know? In, in between your lips and your teeth? Yeah, it's just like a, a dip right, right here. Um, a lot of guys, like when you see Ric Flair, he's got those two little pieces of white tape and you see Triple H, they carry their blade there, you know? A lot of guys carry it in their wrist. A lot of guys will have the referee drop it on the mat, they'll pick it up. But I just always, I like to be in control of my own destiny and not have to have, to have it on my hands or anywhere. And I just keep it in my mouth. And then when I'm done with it, I put it back in my mouth in case I need it. You never cut your mouth before doing that? I've fallen asleep with it, and I've ate with it, and drank beers with really? it, and forgot, forgot about it. Really? Forgot it was there? Left it there for a couple days once, because <laughs> I don't even feel it once it's in there. But it's pretty easy. Do you ever get confused as to where the line starts and stops between being Hulk Hogan and being Terry Bollea? I don't get confused, but I'll, t I'll take advantage of it, you know? Mm. And it's not even it's not even really taking advantage of it. It's just oh, you know, it, it's just uh, it's just always there. It's just, you know, I'm I'm sitting in traffic, you know, and the windows are tinted and I'm waiting forever. But if I put the window down, somebody let me in. Hmm. So I put the window down. Instead of going, thank you, I go, thanks, brother. <laughs> you know, and it's just it's just it's, it's kind of, and not that I earn the right or that I'm entitled, but 
after putting so much time in, it's fun to play with, you know? Yeah. I'm gonna play a game that we always play on the show. I'll explain it to you. It's called Knockout, Chokeout, Wedgie, or a bowl of fried shrimp. I'm gonna show you photos of four people. You have to tell me who you'd like to knock out, who you'd like to choke out, who you'd like to give a wedgie to, and who you'd sit down with for a bowl of fried shrimp. Okay. So Hulkster, first of all, your old buddy, the honky tonk man. Definite knockout. <laughs> Another old friend, Jesse the Body Ventura. Definite choke out. <laughs> Sean Michaels and old friend Vince McMahon. Well, Sean Michaels, I wouldn't want to knock him out or choke him out. He's deserving of a wedgie. Big wedgie for Sean. So that means you're sitting down to a bowl of fried shrimp with Vince? Yeah, it'd have to be. Let's go back to uh, Jesse the Body Ventura. Uh, again, you hear rumors over the years about your relationship with Jesse, hot, cold, he doesn't like you, he does like you, you don't like him. Can you tell me what the relationship is like between you and Jesse? Uh, Jesse was around in the AWA days. He was partners with Adrian Adonis. I was friends with him and Adrian, became best friends with Adrian. Um, Jesse came to New York for a short while. I think he worked one main event against Bob Backlund, went to Japan one day, and they never wanted him back. And out of nowhere, this ongoing hate Hulk Hogan thing started. And he's been on it ever since. And, you know, I've, I, and I hate to, I really hate to even say he's jealous of me because it just doesn't come out of me. But everybody I've talked to always says that. They always say that, they always say that, and I just, I have no other explanation for what would have turned him. Is this man jealous of you? No, he's just a troublemaker. <laughs> Shit disturber is how we say it, you know. But uh, no, he's just, he's just having fun. He's on the internet now telling everybody yeah. that I'm leaving TNA to go to WWE, and you know, of course it stirs stuff up, and he's just having fun. He's keeping himself alive is what he's doing. If your entire video and DVD collection of all your wrestling matches disappeared, was burned to the ground, was lost, but only one match survived on DVD for you to show your grandkids one day, what match would you hope survived? It'd be Andre. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Knowing what you know now about the exposure and the fallout, would you still agree to film Hogan Knows Best? Yeah, yeah, I would. It was... Uh... Hogan Knows Best was something that my family wanted to do. And I wanted to do it because I thought it might keep my marriage together. My marriage was already destroyed and in shambles before uh, we started filming, you know, and, and my wife had another agenda. And I was hoping that if she was working and stayed busy and became this reality star that her whole attitude and mindset would change about her life and what she should be doing. I was praying that that would, uh, it probably kept our marriage together longer than it should have been, but I would have done it again. If you were just to wrestle one opponent, go back to your heyday, you know, mid-1980s, and take any opponent from any part of the history of your career, who would it be for just one last dream matchup? Who would you choose and why? Uh, it would be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Why Stone Cold? It's just he... He had a, a, attained a certain amount of success over a four or five year period, you know, that will go down in, in the, the history books of wrestling, let's put it that way. You know, in the history books of wrestling, there was that stone cold era and all the fans wanted to see me wrestle him and it never happened. Who's the best wrestler you've ever worked with? Randy Savage. Yeah? Yeah. A couple of more people I want to ask you about. One of my favorites, a man who inspired my own career, Gorilla Monsoon. What do you remember about Gorilla Monsoon? Being a pro, just being a real pro in and out of the ring. I mean, you know, when Vince Sr. asked Gorilla Monsoon to put me over in 38 seconds in the garden, he did, no questions asked. Um, I think I jumped him and I had his jacket on or something. And uh, just remember him being a real pro all the time, in and out of the ring. Just a real stand-up guy. Miss Elizabeth. Uh, without her, Randy, his gimmick wouldn't have worked. I actually believe he would have been by himself. It wouldn't have been the same deal. She made it. She made it work. Ric Flair. Best wrestler ever. 
Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What's so good about Rick? He's just, he's, he's, he lives this business. He protects the art form. He's bent to get along with the entertainment genre of this business, the entertainment era. He's bent. He's just, he's, he's, there's nobody better. I mean, he's the best wrestler I've ever seen or been around, you know, and I mean, I remember when I was a fan, he was going hour matches, an hour and a half matches with Harley Race and Jack Briscoe, and he's still out there, and he doesn't complain about being hurt, he doesn't complain about anything, you know, he just, the wrestler of all wrestlers, he's the greatest wrestler ever. Rick Rude. Good friend, miss him a lot, just don't understand what happened. Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henny. Same thing, real good friend, just, it was all so, uh, senseless, you know. An alarming number of professional wrestlers have died young. We just named a few of them earlier on. Do you ever worry that the lifestyle is taking its toll on your body, that it'll shorten your lifespan? No, no, I don't. I mean, you know, the, you know, it's just hard to say what the wrestlers have died of. You know, the Chris Benoit situation was different. You know, they said there are numerous drugs in his system. You know, there's a certain number of wrestlers that have had the same combination of the somas and the cocaine. There have been several, if it's urban legend or if it's the wrestlers whispering of what really happened, that's been, I've heard that more than once. Um, you know, then they say, well, the steroids will kill you, you know, and I've heard all these things. Well, I've always pulled up short. Hmm. You know, with the steroids things, I never was one of these guys. I've, like right now, I weigh 280 pounds. The last time I weighed 280 pounds, I was in ninth grade. Hmm. I've always been around the 300 pound mark. It didn't take something crazy to make me get big when I was taking steroids. I wasn't one of these guys that bought them off the street. I always went to a doctor. Everything, I was always afraid to go above and beyond with anything. You know, with any of the drugs, with anything. So I've always pulled up a little short. You know, I get my blood checked every three to six months, depending on the situation of how I'm feeling. You know, I'm friends with a bunch of doctors around here, and I'm health. I'm 58 years old, trained still. Um, the only thing the business did to me, you know, I'm, first off, I'm not afraid of dying young because of drugs or the lifestyle. You know, because like, like I said, I have myself checked all the time. The one thing the business did to me was I beat myself up a lot with the knee replacements and the hip replacements and the ridiculous leg drop. Mm -hmm finishing move which messed my back up um so on on any of those levels i'm cool you know and if and if i was to die tomorrow it wouldn't be from overdosing on cocaine and somas you know i'm 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 cool you know so I, i'm i've taken good care of myself and hopefully i'll be around for many years to come if you could turn back the hands of time if you had a time machine a delorean to go back and pick a point where you may have may have chosen to end your wrestling career what point would you choose? Oh, I know right where it was. I, before, it was right before this house was built. I was 38 years old, and I was on top of the world, and everything was great with my marriage and, and, and my family and everything like that, and we were living about a half a mile away on an island in a very big house, and my ex-wife Linda wanted to build this home. And she said it was going to be 7,000 square feet. And when I walked the footers, which is the footprint of the house, I paced it out. And it, I said, isn't this more like 20,000 square feet instead of seven? And the answer I got was, well, if the rooms are four or five feet bigger each room, it's not going to matter. And when I saw the house going up, and I saw that it wasn't framed, it wasn't a wooden framed house, it was steel I-beams like a skyscraper to hold this 400-year-old roof on. I said, I better go back to work. But I, I was going to retire when I was 38 years old. I, I, what point was 38? What year was that, roughly? I was pretty much done. I don't know. I'm 58 now. so. Okay, 20, so 20 years ago? Yeah. Okay. It was right after the Andre thing. Yeah. And, you know, heading into the right end of the 80s. So I was pretty much done and had money saved and, you know, enough security to, to last a lifetime. And then the, the bar was raised, and I kept jumping over those bars, and... But, you know, I, I didn't plan on it going this long, but I'm, I thank God it didn't. I wouldn't change anything. I've seen a lot of stuff and, and had a lot of great experiences. The injuries, the operations, the history, the hard knocks, the personal triumphs and tragedies you've gone through, 
has it been all worth it? Yeah, it has. I mean, what, but what, what you don't realize, there are no accidents in this world. I've gone, every, I've gone through everything that I've gone through, the surgeries, the tragedies, the, the personal stuff with my family and, and my wife and, and losing my family and losing everything. I've gone everything I've gone through to make me who I am today. Hmm. I believe that I still have a lot to do, you know. I've got this crazy positive outcome that you know I'm on this path. I'm either in the flow or not with the, in the flow. And right now I'm in the flow, you know. And, and I just feel that there's just so much more I want to do. Brother, you're an inspiration. You've been an inspiration to my career and an inspiration to so many people worldwide for such a long time. And I'm sure you always will. And I'd like to thank you personally for uh, doing the Voice Versus today. It's been an honour. Something I've waited a long time to do. Hulk, I'm going to ask you one last favour. The famous Hulk Hogan shirt tear. Will you do me the honor, brother, of showing me the secret behind the Hulk Hogan shirt tear? I've got a shirt here for you, a yellow one. Gotcha. Let's, Let's do, do this. It. How does this work, Hulk? Well, I can see you've already got the gimmick down. You have a little tear here. Sometimes these collars can be tough. Mm -hmm. It's all in the timing. You don't want to just rip it off. Okay. You kind of like, when you're in the middle of the ring, you kind of, as you rip, you just kind of turn. So, I mean, yeah. we don't have to spin a whole circle, but as you grab it, you grab it, One hand and it's real slow. Right. You take your time, go, and you kind of growl with it, you go, Aah! 